going to delve immediately into the presentation. And um, so in the past, let's call it six months to eight months, we've been developing a close relation with HVS in terms of investigating the cost, the real cost. All these costs, you see, there is a publication, so it's finally out. The bench will, will distribute it. It's also available on hvs.com and on woodcouture.com. And um, I'm a former consultant, so hence the reason I brought back this kind of skill set into the family business in order to understand what the market needs and the dynamics. These are the results. You know, it's much more in-depth. They exclude land meaning you can apply this cost also to our renovation settings. And um, it's very comprehensive. It combines the tens of thousands of information data points that HVS has and our FFN index report, which we publish on a quarterly basis for all the regions worldwide, which is 7,000 projects, one and a half million rooms on a rolling basis. So a very comprehensive outlook of what is going on. But let me take you through the findings. And this is uh, what people said, what the challenges that every project has is not what we're saying, which is different, which is, is very important for all of you, whether you're operator, technical advisor, or developer. First of all, the majority of the design community have a challenge with design briefs. They don't know exactly what they need to design. They don't give them enough time, or the brand vision is not clear, so it's a real challenge. And that translates into an escalation of cost because it's going to come back into the famous stage called value engineering. So the design community needs more support. Poor compliance with property improvement plans. Why? Cost saving over quality is being prioritized. So therefore, in the 24 months post-renovation, the owner does not achieve his return on investment goal. He doesn't achieve the position. What does he mean? Yeah, it looks good, it looks fresh, but why do I get my next in uplift on average rate? It won't come, because if you don't stick to the plan, to the purpose of property improvement plan, it's not going to work. Then the supply chain engage generalist over specialist. I always say to people, I wouldn't like you to go to my wife, gynecologist, to take care of your heart. Although he's a doctor, but he's not a specialist in that field. And exactly work the same in our industry. I'm a manufacturer, but the same is for a FITA contractor. They used to do restaurants until yesterday. Today they take on a 17 room category hotel, 15 F&B outlet. It's a daunting task from an organizational point of view, from an execution point of view. So we see a lot of generalists, so jack of the old trade. ESG, this is a very important, interesting presentation before. Brands, industry are pushing for it, but I'm afraid the supply chain is not ready. You know what I mean? There are requests for particular sustainability to manufacture it, to comply, and I'm afraid the supply chain is not ready. And I'll touch upon later. You know, a very interesting fact. Lack of project dynamic understanding. This is an interesting one. This is what we've got to do with timing and uh, of construction, timing of installation, timing of how long does it take to make things. You know, fabrics, everybody thinks that fabrics, you can just go to a shop buying them and doing it. Some of the most specialist fabrics take 16 weeks to be manufactured by a mill. It's not like baking pizza. So if his royal highness had approved that, and he wants that, you need to account for the time it is required. So unaccounted time changes. Again, from the pre-COVID to the post-COVID, the global supply chain has had to reinvent themselves somehow. So the time frame used for gun chart, to keep it simple, before the COVID era, as slightly longer today. And with all the other factors put together, we need to review the time frame we are allocating for project execution. It's not going to be the same. You know, Mother Nature needs this curse. Everybody wants to give birth in five months, to get rid of go back in shape. But unfortunately, it's still taking nine months. You know, and, and then again, 
that's the nature of business. And uh, if we don't account for it, unfortunately, it's going to hurt us, meaning it's going to cost you more money. Then insufficient product knowledge. The hospitality industry, unlike the residential, the commercial, the retail, and the student accommodation, leave healthcare on the side, is a very regulated. A lot of fire regulations, fire life safety, very important. But a lot of the design community seems to forgot about that. But it's not the fault of the design community, because I go back to the first point. Let the artist enough time to think. Let the artist enough time to do their job, then eventually you get the product and the material that is required for your property, and it's not going to cost you more. So very interesting to how all the only interlinked. Then limited understanding of hotel brand standard, and in particular on the fire life safety. And what does it mean luxury? What does it mean mid-market? So. A lot of the brand standard, unfortunately, they're very obsolete. We quote about 283 jobs worldwide on an annual basis, and we get by hand brand standard all the time. Sometimes I'm speechless to see how some of the brand standard touch upon things that are totally irrelevant. No guest will never notice that. And no guest will ever go and flip a chair or check the measurement of a chair. Absolutely not. Why? I'm a big lad. I'm not a skinny cat. So when all I care is about, is it comfortable, yes or no? So what have we learned from this research? And this is very interesting. And uh, this used to be, on average, excluding land, the typical cost structure background for hotel business, divided by different sector, on average, plus or minus. Yeah, Don't quote me on that. And it is interesting because over time, and it's still the case, you know, one of the area which was the is one of the biggest, one of the biggest pies across the overall total cost. You know, in terms of opportunity, not necessarily in terms of cost. Like the FFE, you know, if you look, the Middle East and Africa account for 7.3 billion dollars worth of demand of FFE supply. They equate to 36 thousand dollars a key on average. Then we look at that. But guess what? From our research, what we have found is that MEP, which is strictly related to um, fire life safety, and the issue we accounted in the previous slides, and lose ff &E, are what? Going up massively. Now, some of them account to 42%. Some of the lose ff &E in project account up to 12% of the total cost. That's incredible. In my consultancy day, they used to tell me the land should never be more than 20% of the total development cost. You know what I mean? Nowadays, we have FFE this 12%. So how can it be possible? You all go back to the how you all started, design. And again, we need to let the design community do their job. We need to allow them more time to get with the operator and the internal team to study, to analyze it, and to create more bespoke as opposed to off the shelf. And what is happening? These are the two major causes of project delay in today's business. No matter whatever region, fire life safety and FFE are the two single largest causes of project delay. Everybody think about his finance. Everybody think about his signing a management agreement, all the sort of thing. These actually are the biggest causes of project delay. FLS number one, lose FFE number two. Why? One, they want to cut the cost because they cannot afford it. And ESG compliant, yes, it's expensive. It's for the planet, but it's also for the life cycling cost. You get better. FFE, total misunderstanding of the product. Now, so again, if these two are the two biggest causes of project delay, why is it? So the first were the feedback. Now we're analyzing the causes. Value engineering, how is it possible? that in all the projects we investigated, they wait until the end of design to say, oh, but let's chop it, let's value the real. I cannot afford that. Why not at the beginning of the design? Engineering value as opposed to value engineering. So 99% of projects, they apply value engineering after the design is done. But again, if you give them a proper budget, people like HVS, Colliers, JLL, CBRE, you name it, they do beautiful feasibility studies. 
why don't we stick to the budget that they put in the feasibility study, if the number makes sense, and try to give to the design community a budget to work upon? Then you don't need value engineering. Then you can plan properly. Nobody do that. We always look for the grass. If it's greener, somewhere else. But guess what? You end up burning your grass because it's going to cost you more. Comfort sourcing. How many times we see the procurement and supply chain being awarded under the general contractor, one-stop shop, or the FITA contractor doing the job of somebody else? Again, the skill set is for one purpose. They're dealing with flooring, ceiling. They don't deal with manufacturing chairs and tables. So the comfort of your procurement department is the expense of your pocket. Why? Because you need to do a thorough investigation whether a FITAO contractor has the skill set to oversee quality and production over a manufacturer, and therefore any categories, not just because I'm a manufacturer of any categories. So the comfort, unfortunately, sometimes costs you dearly. Emergency procurement. One of the typical packages that get la delivered for last is artwork. It is incredible for so how many. Uh, we have so-called beautiful five-star deluxe hotels, and the design community design beautiful artwork, and then they don't know where to go and buy it. But again, either I don't have the money to buy the beautiful paint, or somebody can copy it, or I don't know where to go. Time. And your interest rate goes up in your financing, and the, the clock is ticking, and you're bleeding money. And, uh, and maybe you're opening at the wrong time. So nobody accounts for those costs. Those are, they used to call it opportunity costs. For me, it's a big loss of money, as simple as that. Last but not least is the most important. Before the lady that presented before talked about sustainability and ESG, and everybody go local. We've done an exercise, try to do what we do, which our manufacturing center is in China and Asia, and buy everything local. You burn more carbon emission by buying local. Why? Everybody works in Saudi Arabia. Can anybody tell me where the forest to cut the trees to make the wood? In the Azir region. But if you have to deforestate the Azir region mountains to make the fit out for the entire Saudi Arabia, there will be no more trees in Saudi Arabia. So buying local to support the local community is great, but only when it makes sense. So. The simple notion of going local to looking good, having bravo, you know, I mean, now you're sustainable, you offset carbon emission, now actually you're producing more. And the best example is the car industry. You want to buy a German car in Germany? You know, I mean, if you assess where the parts come from, you actually, you're better off going and buying in another country. Because what is being shipped in that country burn more carbon emission, they're actually going to a manufacturer somewhere, import everything in the same destination. Why? Because they buy everything locally, the raw material, the manufacturing. The only carbon emission is actually in the supply chain. That, and I'm happy to get challenged on this. We've done a very thorough exercise. There is a wrong in interpretation of what is really carbon emission, buying local and that. Not every single lighter can be bought locally, only what makes sense. What are the solutions? 20 years ago, somebody had invented this, and I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm just bringing back old notion. Let like people talk automated hotels. I think the first, what they call it, Formule One, brought by according to the market was the 1970s, and they have electronic key cards in the 1970s. And now we're going crazy. A few years ago, electronic checking, seamless. A core brought it in the 1970s. Why nobody focus on that? Why? Because it was not trendy. It was at the wrong time too advanced. Design and build. If you have a budget from your feasibility, go to a professional company that can actually design it. And when a design is finished, can tell you exactly how much it's going to cost you. They just get on with that. You cut a huge amount of time. In fact, this is the time frame and how much money you save. Proven. It's proven. Six, and a half six to six and a half percent lower cost. 12% Cutting construction time. Imagine over two years, what does it mean? Huge amount of time. Delivery and speed. Cost growth. So even in those countries where they don't even got enough manpower, you can, during the design phase, the contractor can plan for it and get on with it. 
last but not least, which is going to be a trend that, in my opinion, will be emerging. The interior design community having contract of design and supply. Why? Because if I'm designing all these interior spaces, which are very important for your brand, I know exactly what I'm designing. You know what I mean? Why should I not supply it? Because I'm the one putting on a nice rendering. Why not let the design community supply this? They know the quality, they know the dimension, they know exactly incorporate all the element that they've been, they allegedly supposed to be briefed at the very beginning. So by doing that, we have tested in some project that we cut on a two, on a 200 bedroom hotel, five star, with a program of delivering of FE 200 days, as opposed to the average 309 days it takes to complete the full manufacturing, delivery, and installation of a loose FE. So, programming three months, imagine three months worth of saving bank finance interest. Huge. Your IRA will shoot up. Why? Because it's part of the leverage IRA. It's fantastic. Even more money. Last but not least, up to 31 cost saving. Why? Because the planning stage is being done thoroughly with time and assesses every single element that go into the design. So the solution is out there. It just is where the people want to just go with the traditional way this all has been done. Or let's be proactive, saving money and get it on time. Thank you. Filippo, thank you so much. That was really interesting. Before you go, do we have any questions from the audience? Particularly maybe from the design community, because there's quite a big focus on that area. No? I'll ask a quick question then. <laughs> oh, we do have one. Oh, fantastic. Can we just grab a microphone, please? Hello. Uh, thank you. This is uh, very interesting. Um, would you, like, if we look at the Saudi Arabian market, um, do you have any thoughts on the power of the uh, contractors versus the owners, developers, in the sense that with the huge amount of developments uh, happening in the kingdom, uh, the contracting firms now have the ability to pick and choose. Do you have any thoughts on this? Again, I'm going back to the very last slide. If you look at the scale, it's not just for Saudi Arabia, it's for any country that have got the scale of development. It is normal that the general contractor, fit out contractor, are overwhelmed. You know, and most of them don't even have the balance sheet to do this kind of project. Because the way the construction needs to operate is actually is adverse for what is needed to get those projects off the ground. You know, the moment you start going to a general contractor and awarding a contract for a billion dollars with a 10% down payment, and you start asking for a performance bond of $100 million, you start putting that cash flow at risk. And this is the same through the design community. All these performance bond bank guarantees is a total nonsense. They're actually killing themselves with their own end. As opposed to, again, going back, bring the general contractor, sit down with them, show them the program, maximum price contract. This existed forever. Maximum price contract. In many countries, they apply that formula. And then you study the program, you start the delivery, and you support the general contractor to execute, even with a formal control over the finances. I'm not saying, hey, just giving out money. I guarantee you it can be done. The moment you start going tendering, and you just you have a nice consultant to give you a tender document, that there is a lot of nonsense, and they don't understand how practically it works, that's what, this is why you are where you are. Don't, don't be surprised. So my answer is, there is a solution, yes. It just requires flexibility. And this is one of the flexibility and less bureaucracy. If you apply this equals common sense, I guarantee you that any general contractor, FITA contractor, can operate in Saudi Arabia and in any other country that have got that scale and the magnitude. Mm, OK. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Filippo. Unfortunately, no more questions. We've Ciao. run out of time, but that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very much. Thank Thank you. you. Big round of applause.